Thank you, Dr. Fessel. So let's move on to our next talk. We'll begin by Ed Boyden, who is assistant professor at the MIT Media Lab and the joint professor of biological engineering and brain and cognitive sciences at MIT. And he will be talking about controlling the brain with light. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm going to tell you a, a couple stories today about our attempts to use light to program information into the brain and what we think we can do with it, both from a basic science standpoint, understand the principles of how the brain works, and also from a clinical standpoint. I'll show you some preclinical work we're doing to see if we can treat brain disorders through beaming information in, to targets in, in the brain with light. And the basic problem is due to the fact that the brain, unlike, let's say, a silicon computer, is made of many heterogeneous parts, cells that come in many different shapes. They're, some are small, some are large, some have different molecular compositions. And they come in many different flavors, and importantly, also, different cells are atrophied in different diseases. So, for example, in some disorders, like, such as epilepsy, you see destruction of certain cells. In others, such as schizophrenia, you see destruction of yet other cells. So, ideally, we'd be able to dial in um, some information to, to treat these disorders. There's, of course, a very large number of disorders. Many of these disorders um, affect a significant fraction of the world's population. Um, and as you can see, looking over this list, many of these are untreatable, and of the ones that are treatable, say with pharmaceuticals, almost every treatment has prominent side effects, and the cost is enormous. So what we want to do is to figure out how can we program the brain to do uh, proper computations. Of course, pharmaceuticals have been one of the great success stories of the 20th century, antidepressants, uh, drugs for bipolar disorder, and so on and so forth. But of course, as you might imagine, they're going to bathe circuits in a drug and will affect both normal as well as abnormal cell types. And of course, over the last uh, several decades, uh, electrical stimulation has become quite prominent. There's probably about a quarter million people or so who have some kind of electrical implant for stimulating the cochlea or stimulating deep brain targets using electricity. But like drugs, electricity is going to go in the path of least resistance in all directions and will also affect within a microcircuit some of the, the normal cells as well as the abnormal ones. So what you really want to do is be able to target defined cell classes, specific cells which are either defined by their properties, their computational properties, their anatomy, or by the way that they are uh, affected in brain, different brain disorders. And of course, we're all here because we like light. We'd love to be able to turn them on and off with light. And so in order to do that, we've gone back to nature, because photosynthesis and other methods for converting light into energy exist. Uh, of course, the brain works through electricity, so if we can convert light into electrical energy, which is kind of what photosynthesis is, then we win. So um, about five years ago, I initiated a collaborative project. Uh, other prominent people on the project include Carl Dysroth and Gerard Nagel. Uh, we published a paper showing that if you take a, a, a molecule from algae that the algae uses to navigate towards light, the molecule looks something like this, um, you can actually uh, take this molecule, which has unique properties. It actually, when you shine light on it, will open up a little pore and let ions in, which is exactly what you need in order to drive a neuron. So we took the gene that encodes for this protein. It's a completely genetically encoded reagent. There's no need to add chemicals or to add any kind of supplement to make it work. You take the gene for this, pr this protein, and we put it into a virus, so the virus can deliver the gene to these neurons. The neurons will take up the gene and express them, and here you can see these neurons glowing and labeled with this, these proteins. And to a surprise, it pretty much worked on the first try. You fire pulses of light at these neurons. These pores are, are expressing on the membrane. They open up and let positive charge in, and you can make them fire action potential. So here you can see these blue pulses of light resulting in action potentials, not unlike the ones that are happening in your auditory cortex right now as I say these words. And if you put an optical fiber coupled to a laser into the brain of an animal, then you can do all sorts of interesting things. So one of the things that we've been working on is to try and see if you can use these tools to activate neurons and see what they do. What is the sufficiency of a neuron to drive a behavior or to cause a pathology or to overcome a deficit? And so in a paper that we recently published in collaboration with Cliff Fonstad's group, we've been building these multi-waveguide arrays. To make a long story short, these waveguides terminate at different depths along the probe axis. This probe goes into the brain. And as you can see, at the, uh, at the waveguides, let's see, there's a laser pointer here. The waveguides go different lengths down the probe axis. And there's a little mirror here that bounces the light out to the side. Um, the actual waveguide itself is a very simple oxynitride glass waveguide. Um, and to make a long story short, it works quite well. So this probe can emit light out of s about a dozen or two dozen independently controlled points in the brain, making so that you, a single, instead of a single optical fiber, which only can illuminate its end, we can actually drive um, a very large number of points. And something we're working on right now is to tile the brain in three dimensions with this so we can screen through the brain. We can go through the brain, activate and silencing things as we um, walk through it, and we can actually determine what are the causal influences of different circuits in the brain to a given behavior or pathology. 
Now, importantly, um, we've been expanding our horizons over the last several years. Um, we've been mining the genomes of the world, looking for molecules that do other things in response to light. And as an example, you can shut down cells if you were able to put negative charges in, right? That's just hyperpolarizing a cell. Or you could also shut down a cell by pumping positive charges out. And over the last couple of years, we've published a series of papers um, which do just that. So here is an example of a neuron spiking away. That's what these little uh, dots are. And uh, we turn the light on, and you can see this silent period where all the neurons are quiet. We can do a totally digital off switch where we can turn off neurons in the brain, and we can see what they're necessary for. So we could, for example, delete a neuron class and see how it influences both the local and the global circuits and the animal's behavior, which is really powerful. Um, as another example, we've been expanding our genomic uh, uh, reaches. We've been looking for molecules that respond to different colors of light. And so molecules from different kingdoms of life, we've been classifying and finding at sort of an omic level how they respond. So for example, some are more red light drivable than blue. So we can shut off this neuron with red light, but blue light doesn't affect it very much. And this one's blue light silenceable, but red light doesn't affect it very much. So we've now participated in several consortia that are sequencing genomes of thousands of different new organisms, looking for these photosynthetic and photosensory molecules in order to see if we can turn on and off different parts of the brain and to parse out how, these, how all these circuits work together. So to summarize this first little part, these reagents have become very widespread. Our group at MIT has disseminated these uh, tools to almost 400 groups around the world who are working on different neuroscience and clinical questions. And um, there would be widespread use both for revealing how cells work uh, in the context of circuits and to explore mechanisms of brain pathology. Now, importantly, we want to use these ultra-precise tools eventually to figure out if we can treat brain disorders. As I mentioned earlier, there's a very large unmet need for the treatment of brain disorders. And what I'd like to argue here is that it might not be so far out to imagine such a path, especially if we pursue the scientific validation of the various components that we've talked about. So I've already mentioned that hundreds of thousands of people have some kind of brain implant or neural implant, either for driving sensory information into the spiral ganglion, which, which is a cochlear implant, or deep brain stimulation of Parkinson's, about 75,000 people with DBS or Parkinson's. Obviously, there's two unknowns here that I'm going to tell you about in the last part of this talk in the last three minutes and 21 seconds. So one of these things, of course, is you've got to get the gene that encodes for this protein into the body. And Gene therapy, which has, had, has its up and downs, but there's, uh, there's a kind of virus called the adeno-associated virus, which almost all of us have. It doesn't have any symptoms. And this is from a Nature Biotechnology article uh, from a couple years ago, an editorial actually. Hundreds of people have been treated with AAVs in many FDA monitor clinical trials, and there haven't been any adverse events due to the virus itself, which raises our hopes that at least to the extent to which um, these preliminary trials have conducted themselves, we can understand the potential clinical value of, of a gene therapy in the brain. The other thing, of course, is what are these molecules like? Most of us hopefully don't have algal and bacterial proteins wandering around in our heads. Obviously, we've got to test those out as well. So we started a collaboration um, that investigated in a preclinical study what these molecules act like in the brains of non-human primates, which is sort of the gateway towards neurotechnologies getting into the clinic, given the similarity of those brains to, to our brains. So we collaborated with Bob Desimone's and Anne Graveville's labs at MIT, both of who do non-human primate work. And Pretty much again in the first try, we found out that indeed these molecules function. So we could fire pulses of blue light, and this is in the non-human primate, uh, rhesus macaque to be precise, uh, cortex, we could use pulses of blue light and fire action potentials over periods of days to months, and the action potentials looked normal. There weren't any differences from, once again, the kinds of action potentials that are firing in our brains right now, as far as we could tell. So the next thing we wanted to do was to figure out, well, what are these molecules like, right? Because molecules that are foreign to the body can cause immune reactions. And once again, these are molecules that, to my knowledge, have never been in natural brains. So we looked at both our depolarizing opsins and our hyperpolarizing opsins, the ones that turn neurons both on or off, and we collaborated with a pathologist, Roderick Bronson, uh, who works across Harvard, Tufts, and MIT, to try and understand what these molecules would do. And to make a long story short, in terms of me measures that are of importance in pathology, such as you know, derangement of the geometry of these cells, cell death, invasion of immune cells, there didn't seem to be overt problems with these preliminary uh, 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 preclinical studies. That said, we're continuing to, in our genomic search, try to find molecules that express even better, even safer, even more uh, high fidelity. Even as we test things, we're continuing in a vertically integrated way to pursue better molecules, better devices, and so on and so forth. In a short talk like this, I can't talk about all of them, but we're working on things ranging from wireless devices that are fully implantable, that can control various light sources that are made in a solid state fashion, all the way to um, other things as well. Um, we also looked for production of antibodies against these molecules. That's always something that's important to look for. Once again, it's preliminary, but we were uh, inspired by the fact that we didn't see overt responses. And we've also started to find silencers as well and, uh, and to put them into the brain. Uh, and in our preclinical studies, there doesn't seem to be any problems with them either. 
So I want to show one last final um, story, which is there are many forms of blindness where you lose your photoreceptors, your light sensors, but the rest of your retina, the, the part of the eye, of course, that receives light, is still intact. So what if you could just take the rest of that eye and make it sensitive to light, basically converting it into a camera? So what you can see here on the left is indeed photoreceptors, normal retina, and on the right you can see a big gap where those light-sensitive cells are gone. So this is all done uh, by Alan Horsager, and there's a company, EOS Neuroscience, of which I'm an advisor. I just want to show you, this is a, a, a mouse that's blind. It's a model of human blindness. Um, and he's trying to solve a maze. There's a bit of water in the maze to motivate him to move, or he'll just sit there. And the goal for this particular maze is to go towards that platform at the top. And mice are smart, so he solves the maze, but he does it in a brute force search by going down through every single uh, alleyway. And I won't bore you with all these uh, movies just because you know, they, the mouse just goes in and out all the time. Now, one of the things that's, uh, 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 this is now a mouse that has received one dose of the light-sensitive protein, chiropsin 2, after being blind before. And now you can see the animal can use vision to drive its cognitive uh, processes. It can avoid walls, it can go towards the targets. And in general, we're seeing uh, effects where we can restore some functional uh, responses in mice that were previously blind by installing these photosensors, basically like artificial photosensors in the retina. And that's my last slide. I just wanted to throw up um, the uh, acknowledgments, and thank you very much.